good. I'd like to call the November meeting of the Jackson City School Board of Education to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. McDonald? Uh, present. Mr. Moore? Here. Ms. Harlow? Here. Dr. Morris? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. And we'll now have the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, if everybody will stand, and Mr. Broerman's got a couple students to help Hello lead us. Students that are here tonight, if you would come forward, please. Need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Dr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Harless? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. And also need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Ms. Harless? Yes. Dr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Uh, go on to uh, recognition and awards and Mr. Howard. Mr. Berman, you want to bring your students up to be recognized? So if all of you would, all the perfect scores from Jackson Middle School, if you guys would come forward, please. <coughs> I have the pleasure of introducing to you four students this evening uh, that received perfect scores on their spring Ohio State test last year. Uh, Abigail Thompson, she's the daughter of Brian Christine Thompson. She had a perfect score in sixth grade math, and her math teacher last year was Mr. John Graw. Isaiah Armstrong, the son of Patrick and Amy Armstrong, he had a perfect score in sixth grade math. And his teacher last year was Mrs. Alicia Shepard. Brian Lefebvre, uh, he is the son of Bill and Christine Lefebvre. Brian had a perfect score on his seventh grade English and his seventh grade math, the only two tests that he takes in the seventh grade. His English teacher was Mrs. Connie Wilt and his math teacher, uh, Mrs. Kim Regal, and then Emma Webb, who is a freshman this year, she had a perfect score on her eighth grade science test, and she is the daughter of Jeff and Lynn Webb, and her science teacher was Mrs. Monica Coy. And I think all of the middle school teachers are here except for Mr. Groff, so if the teachers would come up, since they're here, <laughs> and be recognized also, Last year was not an easy year for students or for teachers uh, with COVID, and our students did an amazing job. Uh, and our teachers at the middle school, having to teach online, having to do different things with their students, did an amazing job also. And some, if not all, of the students were probably quarantined last year, so they were learning from home. Um, and to be able to have a perfect score going through that is, is just a tremendous job. So congratulations to our students and our teachers.
to get pictures, you can. And uh, Mr. Buck is going to get pictures. And I also forgot to mention Mrs. Michael is here. She's down in Central Southview, but she, uh, she was the assistant principal in middle school last year. Um, so we're glad that we have her last year, and we have a big part of this. Mr. Schwackhammer has a couple of students that he would like to recognize. Today I'm going to recognize a couple of our seniors uh, that have qualified for uh, National Merit <coughs> Scholar uh, semifinalists at this point, and that, that race is still going. Uh, so I'm going to read a, a short uh, passage about what the National Merit Organization looks for. Of the 1.5 million entrants, some 50,000 with the highest PSAT and selection index scores qualify for, for recognition in the National Merit Scholarship Program. However, only 16,000 candidates are selected to receive recognition as National Merit Semifinalists. Top scores from each state are then tabbed National Merit Semifinalists with an opportunity to become National Merit Scholars, which is announced in February. Students who are recognized as National Merit Scholars receive a $2,500 financial scholarship. So if I could have Sarah Lefevre and Chris Hughes come forward at this time, please. First, Sarah Lefevre is the daughter of Bill and Christine Lefevre. She scored a 1430 on the PSAT and a 36 on the ACT, which is considered to be a perfect ACT score. She was also selected as a regional scholar last year. Chris Hughes is the son of Doug and Melissa Hughes. He scored a 1490 on the PSAT and a 34 on the ACT. He was also selected to attend National Regional Scholars last year. Scores for both of these individuals fall within the 99th percentile uh, ranked nationally. So, you've probably heard their names before. I know you've heard a little brother's name previously uh, with the same last name. Um, but both of these individuals have worked diligently outside and inside of the classroom, balancing the demands of academics with those of extracurriculars. Jackson High School and the Jackson City School District are extremely proud of these achievements of becoming National Merit semifinalists. And again, they're still in the running for becoming finalists and being awarded uh, that, that financial award. Okay, so a round of applause for these. I am extremely honored to be able to present these certificates from the Board of Education to these two honored students. I only wish I had this type of intelligence. <laughs> a perfect score on the CT, wow, I, I can't even imagine that. Young lady, my best wishes to you, and I know the board extends theirs too. This, this is just unbelievable, but I am so proud of you, and we wish you the very best. On behalf of the board, congratulations. Christopher, here we are again. <laughs> It seems like every time we're, we're right here doing the same thing. <laughs> Congratulations, buddy. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Best wishes for everything to the both of you. 
this just this just thrills me. This is what this is all about. This is what being on the board is all about. Providing them the opportunities to do this kind of work. Congratulations. <laughs> You can come up too if you want. If you want to get your picture. Anybody else want pictures? Right. More than I can get them if you need. All right, before we move on, if, if uh, you're free to leave now, anybody that doesn't want to stay as we get into the rest of the meeting, this would be a good time to fool you too, but you're welcome to stay also. <laughs> public participation now and we got uh, one person signed in uh, Mr. Frank Souders uh, you can come to the podium there and speak and we'll give you three minutes we've got quite a bit of stuff so we're going to try to stick to the three minutes so yeah so um, just whenever you're ready to start you go right ahead uh, the first thing I want to do is, to, is for everybody in here to look at the person on your left and look at the person on your right uh, because if estimations about the future are, of America are correct, these two people will be dead by the year 2025. And I have the sources for that. And school boards across America are going to help this ha happen. I'm going to leave it to that. You guys can do your own research. Last meeting, we discussed the scientific fact that it is physically impossible to stop a 0 .0 0.06 to 0.125 micron virus with a one micron hole size. Ordinary masks are totally useless stopping COVID. Did everybody understand that at the last meeting? Can I see a show of hands? Anybody not understand it? Don't you go back and do it more? No, we understand. Okay. Next item is McDonald. Last meeting I told you I'm gonna speak and nobody's going to listen. They didn't. Uh, that was just my opinion, but now it's scientific fact. If anyone here would have checked my facts, they would have seen that the number of deaths from the Spanish flu is 50 to 100 million, not 50,000. Fauci did not say 250 million people would die. He actually said 25 million. I was not contacted by any board member about my data. Sorry, that was a scientific experiment. It had to be proven. It's easier to lie to a person than to prove they've been lied to. Science has just proven that. And I'm going to give you guys some more facts not to listen to today. I'll proceed. <coughs> You've already shown it's impossible to filter out a virus and mask from my on holes. Next question is, what happens when a perfectly healthy child is forced to wear a mask against their will? Now we have an entirely new situation, a new set of scientific facts and data. The question is, filtered when filtered in when children are forced to wear a mask. New studies show that children born in society that wears masks have an IQ score of 20 points lower than previous generations. Now this may be a number of factors that could be because of not being able to see facial expressions 
lower oxygen levels. There's a lot of things that need to be determined yet, but it doesn't look good. You got about only about 30 seconds left there. Okay. So. Masks cause lower oxygen levels due to dead air space in the mask, which retains carbon dioxide. When blood contains more carbon dioxide, there's less room for oxygen in the red blood cells. Therefore, less oxygen gets to the brain with decreased cognitive function. You guys had school board meetings and you, you decided we're gonna have meals for the kids because of low sugar levels. Then you turn around and reduce their oxygen levels. If you reduce oxygen levels enough during growth and development, it causes permanent irreparable brain damage. Are you getting this? It's like spinal bifida. If you don't have folic acid in the womb when you're being created, you have spinal bifida permanent. can never be re removed. All right. That's, uh, you got, I know it's short, but we, we just got to stick to it. We appreciate your information there, Mr. Souders. You're welcome to stay, or you can. Well, you know, I've got 12 minutes for the lecture here, and if you don't want to hear it, you don't have to hear it. But, yeah. You know, that's your business. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, move on to the 2022-2023 calendar. Yeah, we're required to uh, allow community input into the creation of the school calendar for the upcoming school year, and the way that works. Myself, Mr. Hemsley, will sit down and put together uh, three options, which our uh, teachers will then narrow it down to uh, two, and they will vote on that. But we will allow any input from anybody in the community for us to consider as we're creating those options for our people to vote on. So hearing no one, we'll go on. All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda. It's recommended that the board approve the consent agenda as follows. Item A, a recommendation to accept uh, the following resignations, and there are four or five of those individuals with the positions noted. Item B is a recommendation to award uh, one-year contracts under the 047 agreement, not more than 30 hours per week for the individuals listed as noted. Item C is a recommendation to employ um, classified subs for the current school year, clerical person and a substitute bus driver. Item D is a recommendation to employ following individuals as certified subs. We have four or five of, of those individuals with the effective dates as noted. Item E is a recommendation to employ the following individuals under limited supplemental contracts for the positions noted. Item F is a recommendation to approve the personnel listed for the latchkey program for the current school year for the wages as noted. Item G is a recommendation to employ three new technology interns. People keep stealing our interns, so we've got three new ones here. Uh, item H is a recommendation to approve Gracie Walburn as a volunteer in the athletic department. Item I is a recommendation for the board to approve the winter sports schedule. Item J, a recommendation to grant the interim treasurer authority to close uh, some bank accounts and transfer remaining funds. Item K is a recommendation to approve a fresh fruit and vegetable grant program. It's about nearly $100,000. Uh, item L is a recommendation to except it says an anonymous donation, but it's Tom Jenkins and Tom and Chris Jenkins, a donation in the amount of $2,000 to be split evenly between the high school baseball and the softball team for equipment and supplies. I think Tom did that for the golf team in the fall. Then. Item M is a recommendation to approve a contract with ProCare Therapy for services to our students out at CLA. Item N is a recommendation to approve a Westview Parent Boosters check in the amount of $75 for the liability coverage for that support group. Item O is a recommendation to approve a contract with South Central High ESC to provide uh, preschool services to one particular student that we have that attends another school district. And that concludes the uh, consent agenda. Any items need removed? by board members for separate consideration. If not, are there any questions? 
If not, then I uh, need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Ms. Harless? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Dr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Pat McDonald? Yes. Uh, new business, Mr. Howard? Okay, item A is a recommendation for the board to approve a resolution that would authorize the hiring of substitute teachers under Senate Bill 1. And the way that would work is you would be approving the resolution which would allow me to create guidelines for these substitute teachers. As it is right now, if you have a four-year degree, you are eligible to get a license to substitute teach, but obviously there's a huge shortage of, of teachers, substitute teachers, and so this legislation is good just for the, the remainder of this school year because everyone's having so many problems uh, securing subs. They have allowed districts to set their own criteria. Obviously, uh, the larger, I mean, if you have a four-year degree, you're going to have so many people. If you have, we could say, you know, you got to have an associate's degree, or we could say that you have to have 30 hours or some number of college hours. We could say you just require that you have a, a high school diploma. And I will gauge that based on how many people that we get to make that determination. So um, I'd like to have the board approve that. So you have a motion to Public approve? Motion. Second. Dr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Harless? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. And now we're going to the financial report, Ms. Hill. I have the financial report is as presented for September and the transfers and advances, you're primarily approving the return of dollars back to general fund that you did in June. Okay. Need a motion to approve the financial report Second. as presented. Second. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Harless? Yes. Dr. Morris? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Now we'll move on to information discussion items. We've got several items there. Yeah, the first thing is uh, health insurance. I just wanted to let the board know that we have uh, finished our negotiations for health insurance and we have been able to renew with the same company. As you know, we have a 9% cap and we were able to come in under the cap, so I want to thank uh, Pat Ball for his work on that. I believe, don't hold me to this, it's either 7.4 or 7.8 percent increase uh, on our health insurance for the upcoming school year. So we've got that taken care of. Uh, item B is I've spoken several times individually with board members about our kindergarten situation in our buildings and all of our uh, elementary principals. Um, our kindergarten teachers have been overwhelmed this year. We've had huge numbers at the kindergarten level. All three of the principals have come to me and asked, said, hey, we have to do something. We've got to get these people some help. There's a lot of kids in those classes, and a lot of them have some very special needs. So some of these kids haven't been in school for, they didn't go to preschool and, and whatnot. So we have, uh, we started this week with uh, AIDS in each of the classrooms. So all of our kindergarten classrooms now have an aid to help them, help to support them. Item uh, C, the vaccination clinics. You've probably heard on the radio or maybe seen in the paper that just like we did earlier, we had sites here at our um, field house where the health department came in and was able to administer vaccinations to our staff and our students. We'll be doing that at each of the elementary buildings. I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but um, we will be making announcements of that. You probably get some, some kind of paper sent home. I do wanna say one thing, cause I got a phone call yesterday, I know a couple of board members did, that um, contrary to what you read or see on social media, we are not giving uh, vaccinations to any students without parental permission. So apparently that's out there on, uh, on social media. That will not happen. Actually, the, the uh, vaccination uh, times are, are in the evening after school's out. Now, we have kids there for 
latchkey and success and so forth, but this is a service that we'll offer to our, our families and to our parents to be able to bring their kid there or as they're picking their child up from latchkey or success, if they want to have their child vaccinated, they can do that at that time. Also, I've had several of our teaching staff that have asked me about getting a booster shot and the health department will provide those at that time as well. Item D, we are required uh, by law, Homeland Security requires that we have a full scale district disaster drill. And this is, this is a huge endeavor. We're going to do that on, Mr. Hemsley, that 22nd or 23rd? 22nd. November 22nd. And there are a lot of parties involved in that. Sheriff's Department, Police Department, EMS, um, Fire Department. There may be another, uh, yeah, maybe another entity or two. We've had a couple of meetings. Um, I'm just, I want to get the word out there a little bit because this is, this is going to be a huge drill, and if people don't know that it's coming, it's liable to scare the crap out of people. So we, we don't want to divulge all of the information because it is a drill and we need to work on some things. But I will probably send a robocall out. That's on a Monday. Is that right, Mr. Hemsley? That's on a Monday. So I'll probably send a robocall out Saturday or Sunday reminding people that we are going to be having a drill. Uh, it does taking into consideration all five buildings, but it's primarily here at the high school with our high school students. It'll really have a uh, little effect on the elementaries, but they are a part of the drill as well. So um, you'll, get, you'll get reminded of that as, as we get closer to that date, but I just wanted to let everyone know that this is a requirement that, that we have to do. While we're talking about that, can you bring resource officer in next month and let him or her whichever it is tell us what they're focusing on this year and how they're doing with the plan that they have to deal with don't they have to write a new plan each year and how they're dealing with that yeah and we may be able to talk about how this went as well at that time so okay thank you I appreciate that um, a couple of other things the media team I got several uh, messages, text messages and emails in the last few days after our football team won in week 12 that said, can you please send our media team to Waverly to do the game because they're just awesome. And, uh, you know, anyone who's tried to watch some of the other places streaming, it just doesn't even compare to ours. However, we didn't really know what the procedure was because you got to get special permission from the High High School Athletic Association. Then we had to talk to Waverly High School and, and make sure that they were okay with it. And the OHSAA has given the okay that, that we can do that. And Waverly has graciously said that we could send kids there to do that. I do want to say one thing, though. It'll be great, I'm sure. But there will be some things that we can't do, like instant replay and some of those things, because some of that equipment – we have here and we can't take that equipment on the road so it'll still be a great production I have no doubt but it might not you might not be see exactly the way it has been in the past so it's just cool that people have noticed and and are actually asking for our media team to go out and and do this work uh, we're also right now in the planning stages of maybe potentially being able to uh, take a pep bus to the uh, to the game on on Friday night uh, the other thing that, two other things, we've talked uh, a little bit about the band trip to Disney that's coming up in the uh, spring, and they have a deadline. Uh, if we don't notify them that we're not going, then they're going to lose all of the money that they've, that they've put forward. So it's, it's a really tough situation for uh, them and, and us uh, to be in. No one wants to say you can't go, but on the other hand, we don't have a crystal ball in front of us. We can't really tell what's, uh, what's happening. So I need some input from, from the board on this. I think they need to be, I guess, uh, you know, the parents and the band director need to be aware that there is a lot of money that they're 
going to be spending on it and that none of us really are going to know what's going on when that time comes, which is, is it spring, spring time? So, you know, that's three or four months away. And um, whatever the decision is, they just have to understand that if, if they're okay with whatever the decision is, you know, they're going to have to be okay with what could possibly happen, which means they, you know, they lose, they could possibly potentially lose that money because, uh, we, like Mr. Howard said, we don't know what's going to happen in the spring with if, if numbers are spiking, things get worse, or it could be out of our hands completely, and we may say we're going to go, and wherever they're going may end up saying, and they could, that uh, they're, not, they're closing down. So, um, so that's just a decision when we make that. Everybody just needs to be clear about, you know, the possible ramifications of it. I agree with you, Pat, that if they're willing to take the risk, um, I, I'm getting tired and sick of seeing the kids miss out on things. This is two years in a row. Um, the world's opening back up. I was at a Ohio State game a couple of weeks ago. There was 82,000 people up there. There was no surges. There were no reports of, of you know, big groups of cases happening. Uh, things are opening back up. Florida's not going to cancel. Yeah, <laughs> Disney's not going to shut down. I mean, Florida's <laughs> not, not going to happen in Florida. Uh, Disney might shut down itself <laughs> if something happens, but Florida's not going to shut down. I think if they're willing to, to, they know, and obviously we all know, that that's the risk they might take, and they don't expect us to reimburse them the money if they lose it, um, that we allow them to move forward. I agree. I agree. And truly, if you're watching the Florida news, the governor, they're not going to shut down. Right. But, uh, again, you know, they do have to assume the responsibility if something does happen. Right. But I think they need yeah. to go. And then, uh, similarly, our baseball team last year wanted to go to Myrtle Beach we didn't allow it, of course, and they would like to be able to do that. Of course, they're running up against timelines to submit things. So hearing that, I'm going to go ahead and tell the baseball team that the same thing, that as long yes. as they're willing to accept the fact that. that something could happen and it could get shut down. But mm -hmm. we're, uh, as of right now, we're not going to tell them that they can't go. Right. So. Right. Okay. And then I have uh, a short uh, presentation here. <clears throat> on COVID information. We've been tracking our data all year long on, on COVID. You guys can look at that one or this one. If you want to move where you can see a little better, feel free to do so. So what, what I have here is um, each, each of our five buildings and by month, how many students tested positive. Now, obviously, we can't pay much attention to November here because we're only, you know, eight, nine days into the, into the month of November. So we've had 180 students that have tested positive since school started. We have the same thing uh, for our staff. For August, September, October, November, December, we've had 23 staff members that have tested positive. So we're at 203 of our people that have tested positive. Nothing those people were sick. I think hospitalized and sick. I don't know to the extent of, I, I don't know that anyone was hospitalized and I don't know to the degree that, uh, I think there were a couple of the, of the adults that were, that got pretty sick. Um, here we have a graph of August, September, and October for each of our buildings. It's color-coded. Uh, you can see the tra trajectory of the lines if you want to pick out a particular building and, and look of how many cases, positive cases they had in August, in September, and in October. So this, these next couple of slides is pretty much the data that you just saw with the numbers. Sometimes some people like to see things in picture form better than numbers. Um, this is our staff positives for the months of August, September, and October. Now this one kind of light blue line, aqua or whatever color you want to call it, looks like that, uh, you know, it's way higher. We've had, we had six people. And what that line represents, it's shared staff. That means it's someone who does not, is not assigned to a particular building. 
maintenance person, uh, uh, maybe a bus driver, somebody at central office. They're, they don't work in a single particular building. This next thing is a whole bunch of numbers, but it does tell you something, but it's not real good data that you can use to make a really well-informed decision. For example, here at the high school, if you look at September 3rd, you go down and you see students, the students plus. That means that on September 3rd, we had five students out who were positive. We had 16 students who were quarantined. Now, the problem with this data is because we changed that COVID data on Mondays and Thursdays, it's not... You, you could be counting a kid two or three different times. So if a kid tests positive on September 2nd, he's counting here, he's counting here, here, three or four times. So you can't simply go across here and add these up and say that's how many positives that they've had. This is the number of students that were out on a particular day who were positive for COVID or quarantined for COVID. And we have that have that broken down for each building and the totals. So if we take a look at our absences, this is the month of August and September. Now this is not just related to COVID. This is total district absences. And you can see that, you know, we had a pretty big spike here. Um, the 14th of September, we had, you know, 14, 15, 16 percent of our students that were out of school. Again, not all for COVID, but COVID had a lot to do with that. Down to September 30th, we were at about 10% of our students that were out. Then for October and November, you can see, you don't see those big high spikes. Actually, yesterday we had 8.5% of our kids that were out. So we were over, we've been over, hovering around 90% here lately. So if what percent of those absences or how many of those absences are related to COVID? So we charted that and again by the dates at the bottom every Monday, every Thursday, the red line is the students that were quarantined and the blue line are the ones that, were po that are positive starting with September 3rd up through November 8th. And we broke that down by individual buildings. So the high school, the blue line, September 3rd, they had five. They got up to actually as high as 12 kids that were out on a particular day for a positive. Down to now, I think yesterday you had one, Mr. Schweikhammer, had one student who's out with positive. Middle school, same thing, same chart. You can see started off at six. Still, they had, you had six yesterday. I think everybody else had one or, or zero. And Southview, you see the blue line touches the, the base, so they have none. Westview, looks like maybe they have one right now. Northview, has none right now. And the total district staff, you know, we had this big spike here. This is counting all of them that are in each building, staff members in each building, plus those that don't belong to a particular building. And then we broke it down by individual buildings for our staff, basically nothing here at the high school. The middle school's been flat for quite a while. Southview's been flat in terms of staff for quite a while. Westview's been no more than one or two quarantines and positives. Northview's been flat for some time. There's that shared staff, people who don't belong to a building. And then the last thing that I want to show you is this. This is a document that we share with the health department. And a lot of people are allowed to work on this. All the principals, 
probably some of their secretaries, uh, my secretary. Pe a lot of different people are going in here and editing this all the time. I've hidden the names here, <coughs> X'd them out so you can't see who they are. But this is the kind of information that we're sharing back and forth with the health department. And what this means is, at a glance, if I pulled up down here at the bottom, you can see positive cases, monthly positives, Jackson High School, middle school, every building has a tab down here. And they click on that tab and they're all different. The high school and the middle school have 250, 300 names on theirs because they got so many more kids. I think the, the elementary buildings have anywhere between 120 and 130 different names on theirs. When I look at this, if I see yellow, that means a positive COVID case. If I see this grade area, these two lines and this line, that means quarantines. Now, I'm going to show you that most of these quarantines aren't, aren't due to the school district quarantining. And if it's still white, it means that they're quarantined right now. This, these gray mean that these kids were quarantined, but they're back. They're back in school now. The white means that they're currently quarantined. You can look at the dates and see that they coincide. These kids are not back in school yet. But look at some of the comments where we put person exposed to. Dad positive, sister positive, uh, waiting on mom's test results, brother positive, grandma positive, mother being tested, sister is positive. So most of those quarantines that you saw earlier on those graphs are because of things that are happening outside of the school and at home. You know, if, if mom works wherever and she gets COVID, and you got two or three kids in the household, they're gonna be quarantined. Nothing to do with, with us. So, having looked at all, all of this data, I think that we all know that there's a time where we're gonna have to move on. I, and you could make the argument that, and I will, that a lot of the reason that our numbers are what they are is because of what we've done. The fact that we have been wearing masks, the things that we're doing in the classroom, all those kind of things matter. But there's definitely been a trend of things going down. So what I'm going to do, and the board has given me permission to, in our policy, allow me to be able to make changes as we move forward, starting Thursday at Jackson High School, and at Jackson High School only, masks will be optional. And we will track that data for the next few weeks. We've got 11 days of school before Thanksgiving break, and then we've got another 13 days of school before the holiday break. So we'll, we will track that data, and if we see big spikes, then we'll, we'll make changes. My goal is to hopefully that, you know, at some point in time, once we come back from the holidays, that we'll all maybe be able to be optional. Can't commit to that just yet, but right now, it's, I think the high school, it's fitting that we do that because honestly, high school kids at three o'clock, they're not wearing their mask anymore after three o'clock. And they're not wearing it on the weekends. I mean, they're going to everybody's house and doing all those kind of things. The younger kids, not so much because mom and dad are keeping them close to their vest. But with the high school kids, I see it every day. I mean, at three o'clock, I promise you they're not wearing a mask anymore. Also, this will give time for those parents who want to make sure that their child is vaccinated, the five to 11 year olds. We're not making any changes at the uh, elementary or the middle school right now, because we still have some kids at the middle school who may not be 11 yet and can't get vaccinated. So also the middle school is kind of, it's kind of our problem child because we have Mr. Berman there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because uh, we don't have a lot of space there at the middle school. I mean, it, it's really cramped. They're on top of each other. Plus, we've got a population of kids there who aren't eligible yet to be able to get the vaccination. So once the parents have had the opportunity, if they want to have their children vaccinated, we don't see spikes come from this in the next few weeks, then the goal, I think, is, at least as far as I'm concerned, the board can always uh, do something different, but would be that at some point after the holidays, um, we probably need to allow a little period of time to see, 
you know, what happens, because everybody's going to be getting together over Thanksgiving. Everybody's going to be getting together over the Christmas holidays. And at some point after that, hopefully, we can say these things are optional and people can wear them and have their children wear them if they want or not. Also, we know that at the high school, we've got about 90% of your staffs vaccinated, I think. So. And those kids, again, have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. So that's uh, where we're at. So starting Thursday, that'll give me a day to be able to send out a, a, a robocall to let people know that at Jackson High School, masks will be optional. Oh no, the uh, the bus the busing thing will stay the same even for high school kids. That's that's federal. We can't do anything about that. So, but inside the building at the high school, it'll be optional. Any questions? All right. If not, um, <clears throat> the next part is the uh, we're going to move to executive session to discuss employment of personnel and compensation of public employees. So. This is going to be rather lengthy. Um, we're going to allow our media staff to, to secure when we come back. When we do get back from executive session and adjourn, there won't be any action taken, so we will be adjourning as soon as we come back uh, so we can discuss these two items, which will probably take a while. So you're free to leave. Are we not going to do closing items before that? We can. Yeah, I just wanted to get this out first, and then we'll do that. But that's what that's the plan, so you're welcome to stay, but there will be no action when we come out of it. So so now we'll move on to board members with closing items. Uh, I've got a couple things. As far as you were talking about people being contacted about the vaccine clinics and that people were getting vaccinated without parental, uh, what was happening at the high school is kids would show up at the vaccine clinics w with a piece of paper signed. They didn't have to have a parent with them. And that's what was happening um, because they could show up without a parent to be there. They were signing themselves. And I, I heard that from, I mean, I have a kid at the high school. I heard that from several people. Shouldn't be an issue with the elementaries because none of our buildings are really accessible by walking or right. kids are going to have to have parents there. So that shouldn't be an issue, but that's what, that's where that came from. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about is uh, our dress code. I've brought it up to fill you a couple of times. Um, I get calls at least two or three times a week or somebody sends me a picture of a kid that got dress coded. I don't I think our staff is doing a fantastic job of enforcing our rules. I think the dress code needs to be reevaluated. Um, you know, if you have a hole this big on your hip, you're dress coded. Um, I think the issue is our dress code. And I think that we uh, as a board need to uh, reevaluate that and in the very near future vote to either keep it the way it is or make some significant changes to it. Um, because it seems like that's all you guys are getting done is pulling people out of class or teachers pulling people out of class that you have a lot more important things to do than that um, especially at the middle school and the high school where they you know i don't think it's as big an issue with the elementaries but um so i think us as a board we need to reevaluate that um in the next you know maybe that's something we can bring back we could look at um that over the next month and then discuss it at the next meeting the only thing that i would uh, say about that is um I checked with Mr. Swackhammer and Mr. Brawman after I'd spoken to you, and I wanted to see the data behind that. And we had had, it was last Monday, and so we had been in school for just over 50 days. We had had 44 uh, dress code violations at, at one building, 45 at the other. So that's less than one violation a day for a building that has 575 kids and well over 600 kids. Um, and then beyond that, I would say that's how many were reported or, or sent to the office. But the number of students that were actually disciplined was one. Out of those 44 and 45 kids that went to the office, there was one young man who was actually um, sent to in-school suspension because of the others were asked to change their change their shirt change their pants call your parents whatever so i i don't think it's i think we're always going to have regardless of who of whatever our dress code is i mean if we said every kid's got to wear red every single day somebody's going to send the kid down for having on a kind of a pink shirt and somebody's going to have to be the final arbiter and say ah that's red you know I might look at it and say that's there's nothing wrong with that 
Alice might say, well, no, that's a violation of the rules. So there's always going to be somebody that's going to have to make a judgment call on that. So I know it's tough for these guys because they, mm -hmm. they're constantly getting beat on about it. Um, I don't disagree with you, but I think if, if almost every day a kid's being pulled out of the classroom for what they're wearing, then there's a miscommunication somewhere. The word is consistency. Let's be consistent in the... So I still think it needs to be looked at. Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean, you, I don't have a problem with looking at it. I'm just saying that I, I personally don't think that one, less than one student per day out of 600 and some is, is a huge issue. But some of these things, I and mean, we have, we did make the one change, which was the holes below the, you know, below the, the knees or whatever. We, we made that change. There may be some other things that here that we can change. I'm just saying that regardless of whoever's in charge of every building, whether it's me, you, Brian, whoever it is, everybody is not always going to come to the same conclusion. We're all going to have differences. It's very subjective, and it's, it's just it's not an easy job, but we can convene a, a dress code committee and look at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No? All right. Um, I need a motion to uh, move to executive session. So moved. Second. Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Harless? Yes. Dr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Smith? I don't want to, but yes. <laughs> Mr. McDonald? Yes. So, like I said, you're free to stay, but there will be no action. Uh, media guys, you can secure everything and you can leave after you get everything taken care of there. We can just stay up here.